I'm very excited to bring on our next speaker. You know who he is. He's the CEO of Time Warner. Please welcome Jeff Bukas. Thanks, sir. It's right there. Hi. Thanks for coming out, sir. Welcome. Good to be here. You were asking me who this audience is. This, yeah, is, this is the internet. Ah, the internet. I've heard about it. You used to run the internet for a while. Some people. Yeah, you, you got stuck running the internet for a bit. That was uh, back in AOL. the AOL days. Yeah, you remember AOL? Wild. These are a little low, you know. We could fix it. Uh, Verizon paid four billion dollars for that, so it's still got good. some value. And uh, good, good, hope good for them. Yeah, you recognize some of these guys. Um, let's talk about news. You're in the middle of a deal. Mm -hmm. I realize you're restricted on what you can tell me about that, but what's the status of the AT&T Time Warner deal? When do you think that will close? Um, well, we don't know. We're in the uh, normal process of a Department of Justice review, and uh, that's going along as you would think. But you don't know what the timing or what course they will follow. So you guys announced this deal last fall? Yes, October. Then, then Donald Trump was elected? Mm-hmm. Um, how has that changed your calculus about how you think about this deal's chances and what you have to do to get this deal done? Uh, we don't think, you know, I don't think, um, and we'll see if this is right, we don't think merger and competitive industry analysis is particularly political, or at least we all should hope that it isn't. So we don't necessarily think it would change particularly. DOJ has got a pretty clear um, set of precedents and law and precedent to follow. And but there's nothing precedented about Donald Trump, right? There's a whole, you, you, I'm sure you paid a lot of guys a lot of money to explain how the deal was going to work, how it was going to go through, what the yeah. odds were, and then you basically throw a hand grenade in it. And how do you... How what, do you what, are you what are you calling the hand grenade? Donald Trump. <laughs> okay. He's the human hand. Um, how, do you, how do you adjust... Look, I don't know. You know, the... the uh, I think the, the rules on what is pro-competitive and what isn't, or the assessment of that, is properly done by the Department of Justice. And I don't think that the uh, who's occupying the White House really changes that. So we, we're not particularly thinking that that's a significant factor. So again, this And you can't, as you yourself, I think, are saying in the question, you can't predict whether there will be any kind of unexpected or unusual. Right, but you used to be able to say, well, the candidate has said this, he's got these kind of people working at DOJ, these, and yeah. thus this thing will happen. Well, you know, if you look at the antitrust chief, it, it seemed to be a pretty reasonable pick. So that's, that's your good omen, or you, your, 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 your good sign. Well, I wouldn't uh, make any guesses about even the president. You're not going to say something that's going to screw this deal up on this stage. I don't think we need to, do we? I mean. Uh, it's good for Americans, it's good for you in row two. <laughs> more video choice, more innovation. Uh, there's got to be something in it for the Valley, right? Because we're here at Recode, so, so there has to be Yeah, something. yeah. Well, we'll talk about what the Valley wants. It's something for um, the Valley and everything. Let's talk ab uh, about this. Because the Valley doesn't have enough. They need more. <laughs> Needs more. You should have seen the Mary Meeker slide earlier. It was yeah. all Valley, 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 Valley. Yeah. Um, Again, I, I've heard you guys explain it, but I'd like you to try again, um, because when people ask you what the benefit of combining the two companies is, I get yeah. a little lost. Uh -huh. Randall Stevenson, who's going to be your boss if the deal goes through, said something to the effect of, well, we'll learn more about our customers because we'll have access to them, and, and maybe one day that will lead us to making 20-minute episodes of Game of Thrones. I don't think that's literally what he meant. Do you, no, have, I, do you have a sense of what he I think he was meant? trying to give it. Sure. He's very excited about... Uh, there's so many levels to this, and so am I. So if you look at what is happening in the entire media infrastructure, so think of five years ago, it was a pretty long time ago, we now have mobile video, we have broadband video, we've got much better at-home video choices, more yep. bundles, much better navigation, all of these things. And you think back, and it's hard for me to believe it, but when we announced what ended up being called TV Everywhere, our effort to get more VOD, better interfaces, mobility, doesn't matter what device you use, you can get it on broadband, you can get it over your set-top box. We tried to do that seven years ago. You it dragged was. Brian Roberts up in Philadelphia. Yeah, we tried to do that, it. and it took forever. If, and many of you probably, depending on who your video provider is, 
you may not have from you know, somebody sitting right here and somebody next to them, the same options in terms of channels, bundles, navigation. Um, and that's really a shame that it's taken that long. And I think, and so does Randall and the AT&T management, if we put together their abilities and retail distribution, which is a national retail uh, capability, yep. and increasing explosions of mobile innovation, and I hope everybody's working hard on taking applications and content, uh, the form of it and the way that it's delivered for mobile. You're looking at another era where we've already had tremendous spending and innovation if you think of all the original programming on the quote network channels. Now you're going to get it in an interaction between short form, long form, but uh, I still don't get how combining the two things under the same owners yeah. changes that, right? They've still got... A, well, we can AT launch things faster. That's basically... AT&T still has to do a deal with Showtime and CBS, mm -hmm. and, and Time Warner will still have to do the same kind of deals with Comcast and yeah. Verizon, and they literally can't offer something that's not available somewhere else, right? Well, we wouldn't because it's not good for us. It's so, not good business. But so think about if you... Well, well, you've got 25... 30 million direct TV subs, you got 75 million mobile subs. And if you can launch products, whether it's new network bundles, new configurations, new sorts of programming, and you have distribution with direct retail data, so you know who's watching. And by definition, you know, it would never work for us to have a, think of a network service or a show that's only on one distribution platform. It needs to be on all of them. Right. But if you have a national distribution, kind of a pump priming, where you're seeing something, consumers are loving it, it's hard to think that if it was something that was succeeding with consumers that got launched, let's say, at ATT Direct, let's think of direct, uh, the, the direct package we just put out, that it wouldn't be adopted by Verizon and Comcast and T-Mobile and all these other companies. And you need to get it started to get the competing companies to add to it. How much of this is about not, traditionally the kind of media business you were in, you didn't have a direct connection. Well, that's a big. Consumer. You're a wholesaler, right? You're dependent yeah, on Time big, Warner Cable. Big part and of it. We did have it with uh, Time Warner Cable. Right, we used to, we could talk about that. But, but how much is so of, of this merger is driven by the fact that as powerful a company as Time Warner is, mm -hmm. you don't know who your end consumer is? Well, a lot of it. Part. Yeah, that's a big thing. And for, I hope we get to talking about how to get on an equal footing in the advertising business with the giants of YouTube and Google, Facebook, Amazon, all of whom I'm sure, have let's talk about that. How are you going to get an equal footing on them? Well, it's hard to get an equal footing with them, and I'm sure some of them are here, and they probably have very good seats. Yeah, they put full freight. They have well, 85% you know, We think the there market. ought to be, and I'm sure they like this, more innovation and more competition. What, do, you, do you really want to be in the ad business going up against? Yeah. Why not? Selling, selling HBO is a great business, right? Well, remember, Correct. we've always been in, we got the, we invented the TV supported by subscriber, not ads, right. at HBO. Now you have seven or eight of those, Showtime stars, Netflix, yep. Amazon, uh, et cetera. They're all trying Hulu. to figure out how to get into the content business. Yeah. It but that, like that Netflix was figured out. So Amazon let's stay. So you had subscription support. Yeah. Then you had on the other side when we started that we had CBS, NBC, ABC, and then you had these networks in the middle that came up: TNT, FX, etc. And those have subscription support and ad support. And you can tell with the programming: the more you go to non-ad funding, the more targeted the programming is. The more you go to ad and no subscription funding, the more broad-based it is. The, you get these networks in the middle, you get a combination of programming. Yep. It's pretty healthy. Now if you add mobile and short form video, which can be accomplished with broadband delivery or mobile devices, you get even more differentiation of content. Seems like you guys would want to go to the business that you're great at, which is making this stuff that people want to pay directly for, and leave the ad business, which is dominated by Google and Facebook, and say, you guys have it. No. 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 Are you leaving out CNN, Cartoon Network, TNT, TBS? You tell me. I mean, maybe we go to a world where people who really want CNN just buy it directly and they don't buy ads. Reed Hastings was here earlier. I said, why don't you add ads to your service? You can do more with it. He said, no. It's, everyone here applauded. So they he, all want to pay he, Did he announce any price increases? Not yet. Ah, OK. But he probably will, right? And they'll keep paying for it because it's a the product they like, and they like not having ads. Fine. We don't have them on HBO. 
You're not going to add them into HBO. No. No. Um, you talked about Time Warner Cable. You, you used to run a conglomerate that had Time Warner Cable. Yeah. Started with AOL. Yeah. Um, Warner Music, Time yeah. Inc. Over the years, you have gotten rid of all of them. Um, start with Time Warner Cable. So initially, you had content and distribution together. Yeah. Then you got rid of distribution. Now again, you're getting together distribution. So what's the difference? Okay, if you go back, that was 2008. Yep. Now we had that for 20 years. And uh, it's kind of interesting. That's a different era. There wasn't much broadband delivery. There wasn't much VOD. There wasn't much direct uh, offering of video and then tracking who's using it, what do they want, what kind of advertising might work for them. So we spun it because at the time it was only about 12% of the country and it wasn't national. Very different today because if you take ATT, direct, mobile, all of the elements of it, it is national. It's got a national footprint. You can get it anywhere and it not only itself is national, it has national competitors. And we think all innovation we've ever created, and we can go through a long list from pay TV to satellite delivered to 24-hour news, original programming on TBS, TNT, HBO, uh, multiplexing, VOD, all started at our company. We never tried to do that or thought it would work unless those innovations didn't go to every other network and every other distribution form. You all know it, you can't, if you're sitting out here in the audience, I'm sure that everybody here has got 10, 20, 30 different distributors and they're all watching CNN, HBO, et cetera. So it's gotta be everywhere, it's obvious. But when we have a national mobile broadband and video distributor, which is what AT&T is, with direct information, we can at least get started with new product innovations. And I think the competitors to AT&T and to our networks are going to want to introduce any innovation we do. And we have a very fundamental experience, which is, and I think um, if you're in the TV or network business, it's obvious. You're not selling your networks by themselves, and other than the premiums like HBO, Showtime. What people want, if they're interested in news or kids or general entertainment, they want TNT and USA and FX and AMC. They want HBO, Showtime, Netflix. They want the networks they want. They want the things that kind of go together. So you, you want to spur innovation, but in this industry, you need it basically to be adopted by the competition. So this, this stripping down that we were talking about where you sold off all these parts, were you doing that with sort of this transaction or a transaction like the one you're doing with AT&T in mind that you, by getting rid of the other parts of the company, you would eventually increase the value of what was left? Yeah, but that wasn't the main reason. The main reason was there wasn't a particularly strong benefit to operate, let's say, Time Magazine next to or with HBO or Warner Brothers, nor was there for Warner Music with Warner Studio TV film. So we basically took those things that had no benefit of cooperation and which in fact in most cases needed to join some other like thing. Yeah. And we made them free. He famously said in one of the journal articles, he said synergy is bullshit. No, I, I was saying well, at the time synergy was being used for people to justify buying, you know, eggs and ice cream as though they were going to eat them together. And if it isn't that, you don't do that. And what we were doing is taking things that didn't fit together with Time Warner, putting them independent so they could join something that would help their operation. And if you look at all the spins, essentially that's what, that's happened to AOL, it's happened to magazines, or almost. And it happened to the music company and to, uh, the cable company. So there are people in this room, I've talked to some of them, other folks outside who said, you selling, you agreeing to this deal last fall, you are the master of timing, you have timed the market perfectly, you are selling at the peak, everyone wishes they had done what you're done, they're all scrambling now in your wake, uh, and there's gonna be this move to consolidation because of this deal. Do you get that feedback from your, your fellow moguls? Yeah, they don't, I don't know. They don't praise you? <clears throat> no, I don't think that, if that's what they think, they're not telling me. Um, what we really think is how you started this conversation, which is we wanted to take, we have a very strong 
and pretty at scale content creation business, Warner films and TV shows that we sell to all networks. And then our networks, we have a very concentrated must see group of networks as we like to say. And uh, what we can all see in the TV network business going in through the new distribution is you need direct retail connection, you need data. And we're increasingly competing with West Coast you know, based global companies that want to get in the video business. They want to be in subscription and advertising. And they're using massive amounts of data and direct connections to people, the viewers, yeah. in order to do that. And we need to be able to compete with them. I asked Reed Hastings this. He didn't want to offer any advice. But, but Netflix and Amazon have gotten into original content. They're spending a lot of money. It seems yeah. to work to varying degrees for them. Yeah. The Albanian Army, 100 million well, subs I, now. By the way, it's good for them. They've done a good very for them. good job at that. You're seeing guys who have a lot of assets, Apple, Facebook, and Google, who yeah. look like they want to get in there, but they're kind of nervous and they haven't really jumped in. They're sort of around the pool. Well, Amazon has. A Amazon has, yeah. but uh, Facebook, Google, and who am I missing? Apple have not. Right. Well, YouTube well, why do you has think? to a certain extent. Yeah, but just around the edges, right? Yeah. And, you know, so Apple's going to do a TV show, maybe two TV right. shows. Why do you think they're reticent to do it? And, and do you, is it harder than it looks? Well, it's, yeah, it's hard. It seems like you've take a bunch of money. You no, know, you should you, all realize this is a lot harder than it looks. It looks like what you do is you take the guys that are making right. shows for HBO yeah. and you write them a check that's the same size or bigger. Right. And they make it for Netflix or Amazon. Well, you get that too. So that does work. Well, you know, it, it's, if you think about the things we did, we like to talk about ourselves because it's part of the media business, yeah. right? We're all self-involved. So when we did whichever shows or innovations we did at HBO or TNT or CNN, you know, we knew that others would follow, co copy, compete, and uh, we're used to it. So it doesn't surprise us. I want to ask you about politics again. Hillary Clinton was here earlier. Yes. Um, she had a list of reasons, uh, a list of things that were... All right, I'll say it. Yeah. I should not have had a private server. That's, I'm, I'm admitting. <laughs> that was a very subtle joke. I think Sorry. half the room didn't get it. Um, she, she complained about other things. Well, that's the wrong way. Among other things she said were problems for her were media coverage, media coverage of the email servers in particular she was talking about. Yeah. She didn't single out CNN, but lots of other people have said CNN really gave Donald Trump a boost over a year and a half by giving them lots of coverage. Do you ever have second thoughts about the way you guys tr handled Trump? Um, look, if not, well, look, we, all, we have second thoughts about every part of our news coverage. We're constantly looking at it to see if we can get it better or get it deeper. Um, if you do, are you doing Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? Trump. Oh, okay. Went from Clinton he to said, Trump. You're saying because of exposure that he had on you gave him, you the gave him essentially free access for a long time without so any pushback. Helped him. So would, could somebody tell him? You yeah, know, he's changed his mind. <laughs> okay. But for a long time, he had a good because relationship. Because if that's true, he seems to be a prominent person that doesn't know that. Do you ever? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever think, we, we, we get, had, we, had get, we replayed it, maybe we would have done this differently? Uh, you mean on that? Yeah. Well, I'm going um, to defer, and I agree with him, that's why I'm going to defer to Jeff Zucker, who, who said this publicly. As we look back on the attempt we had, we're trying to look and take the Republican side. We had 16 original candidates on the Democratic side. We had a very interesting development with Bernie Sanders coming in. Nobody predicted that on either side in the news business. And we were all trying to cover it, make sure we weren't closing off access to the candidates or, or whatever was going on. So it was pretty unconventional on both sides of the aisle. Uh, by the way, an aspect of that that hasn't been covered enough by the news media is, remember all this thing we all said we knew that money would affect the outcome? Very interesting situation on the Democratic primary side. Seemed to not work quite that way. Certainly not on the Republican primary side. And as we look at what went on from the nomination process, unconventional, to the election, um, you know, you had kind of unpredicted outcomes. Yep. And we were simply trying to cover it. You did have a difference, now go to the Republicans, in the willingness of the candidates to come out. Donald Trump was constantly trying to get on the air and on stage. You know, you didn't have did, to Did ask you ever 
So all that's the, part of the reason why I think he got more access is when you asked the others to come, they didn't come. Did you ever call down to Jeff Zucker and say, what are you doing here? What's, what are you doing? Well, I, we don't talk about how we manage. You've done it a couple times, not about Trump. oversight about the news, but we talk a lot about how are we covering this? Are we getting it right? Are we fair? Are we open? And, and do you, did you ever say, what, what are you doing here? Are you? Well, you look, look, I'm not, you're asking it like yeah. that I express it as a skepticism. Uh-huh. No, I was expressing it as, all right, here are all the unknown dimensions of this election. How are we dealing with each of these? Another aspect, because you asked about it, was the panels that we had. It was very hard, think of the Republican side, to get adequate representation of all the different points of view in the panelists because you had net Trump supporters in the Republican side, you had anti-Trump supporters in the Republican side, you had Democrats who obviously weren't Trump support. So you had all of that going on. And on that side of the aisle, a lot of discussion between the different campaigns and CNN of whether we were you know, having a fair balance of panelists. Rep it's not easy to, to get those. Two more quick politics questions. Yeah. Uh, net neutrality, I've talked to you about this in the past, yeah. and um, you seem more skeptical about net neutrality regulations than someone I, than you would think from someone from the content business. You'd think you'd be firmly in 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 favor of well, we're, look, net, net neutrality. neutrality is like a lot of things in modern life. Nobody seems to agree on what you're talking about. If you think of, uh, are you talking about preferential bit access and flow through? Or are you talking about advertising data? Which part of it are you talking about? The notion that, that someone who has control of a pipe yeah. um, is able to offer someone preferential treatment. Well, they don't. Right, in part because there's regulations about no, that. No, actually, they didn't before. They, they didn't even do that when they could do it. Right, which is where we're headed now. They're going to say, we promise not to do this. Yeah, so I, you know, the issue I thought you were raising on net neutrality was the issue of usage of data because you had the FCC putting requirements on the telcos and cable companies. And then you had the FTC putting a much more lax set of requirements on privacy and data use to the, quote, digital companies. And, pr and prior to the AT&T deal, you were more in favor of lax regulation. You were more in favor of the guys. Well, I just think it should being... be even. OK. I mean, there's no reason with, if you took Google and Facebook taking, what is it, three quarters of the digital ad growth to them. There's no reason that they should have more lax standards of data use than other competitors. Maybe someone from Google or Facebook will ask you about that. One last question for you before we open yeah. it up. Uh, at one of these things last fall, uh, you were asked if, if Donald Trump was a threat to the First Amendment. You said, no, the Democrats are because well, you're, they were you're pushing against right. Citizens United. Right, right. Right. Since then, we hear reports that Donald Trump has asked Comey to jail reporters. Mm -hmm. Reporters are getting slammed to the ground. Um, have you rethought that stance at all? No, well, first of all, I don't agree with this, what you're saying was the stance. Let me just say what the stance is. We have a news company, and we have a free expression entertainment company. We think it's very important to preserve the right to free speech and the First Amendment, particularly for news and political debate during elections. And when people were asking us at that point, they were focused more on these statements coming out of the Republican yep. candidate. And we were, and have, I think, proved that we're going to exercise our First Amendment rights. What I think was also happening is you had some discussion in the Democratic Party platform about changing the First Amendment. And it's a complicated thing, because Citizens United is something that people comment about not having read the thing. They think it's about contributions to campaigns. What we're focused on is the holding in that uh, case that said, you don't lose your First Amendment rights if you join a labor union, if you become part of an association like the Sierra Club, or if you're a, not a profit co corporation like CNN, CBS, the New York Times. You have the right, right. to offer political commentary during elections. And you were talking That's about the plank finding. in the Democratic and any, Party. And any erosion of that would be a threat to democracy. OK. We, we, had this, we, we went back and forth on this before, so I want to make yeah. sure you got it out in your own words yeah. in front of this audience. You guys have questions? Read the opinion for those that are interested. You may not have questions. It's only 300, I think it's 310 pages. It's pretty interesting. 
Mr. Shaw, I'll read. have a question. Hey, Jeff, Luke Shaw with Bloomberg. Um, given the growth of Google, Facebook, Netflix, and Amazon, the kind of slips in subscribers to many of your cable channels, and some of the stuttering in, in advertising, what are you seeing in the pay TV business to make you think that it's not in slow, inexorable decline like Reed Hastings seems to think it is? You mean pay TV, you're calling any, whether it's the big 30, 50, 100 channel bundle or an HBO? The, the TV networks the that TV you own, network. why are TNT, TBS, okay. all of them going to get bigger? Um, well, what we're, what we're hoping, if any of you like cartoon, CNN, TNT, HBO, is that whether you're getting it over in a big bundle or a small bundle, whether you're getting it over a TV set-top box or whether you're getting on a mobile device, whether you're doing it broadband delivered or the traditional older MPEG-4 delivery, that you're going to subscribe to it in one form or another. That's what we're trying to do. And you do have erosion in the traditional bundles. You have a growing um, set of subscribers joining these other broadband or mobile or other kinds of different bundles. Those have better navigation and more VOD capability, which is, I think, the thing everybody wants. And that's where we see it. We'll have to see how the new uh, parts of the media or the video infrastructure, whether they mitigate the loss from the old infrastructure. John. Uh, hi, Jeff. John Ford from CNBC. Um, Reed Hastings said that he's told his content team that the batting average is essentially too high. That they, they got too many hits, which means they're not taking big enough risks. Is your team taking big enough risks, and what would you point out as being may, maybe one or two of the, of the best risks uh, they've taken in content, whether they worked or not? But I thought you were saying I need to cite flop. Yeah, you can. I mean, it okay. can be a great risk that I won't didn't work out. It's just good try. You're not so telling the guys at HBO hard. fail more, right? Well, look, in a way we do. You know, it, it's interesting. With, pre, with, with subscription paid TV, Netflix, HBO, Showtime, we don't care what the audience is. That we're not trying to make a show. Girls, we did not pick girls or Game of Thrones or John Oliver or the Curb Your Enthusiasm reboot because we were trying to maximize ratings. See, they're each for a different audience. So the whole def definition when you're in non-advertising, subscription-only TV is a little different about what you think a hit is. Take the show why, well, you want to be current. So um, we had a show, Big Little Liars, this year that was another pretty big hit show. We have some much more narrow uh, shows, including um, Veep. Well, Veep, Silicon actually, Valley. Veep, Silicon Valley are actually getting a fairly broad audience now, which is not it started small. Did what you consider, we started to do. Did you consider Big Little Lies to be a big risk? Well, we consider everything to be a big risk because if you're you're putting on a show with a specific voice, what again the way we measure that in pay TV, as we used to call. It, is it's not just whether you get five million people instead of four million people. It's whether the show did what you wanted the show to do from a creative point of view. So I'm not, you know, if Curb Your Enthusiasm stays in its target audience and doesn't become Game of Thrones, which it shouldn't and it won't, and nor would we screw with it so that it did, it's still a hit because it's doing what we aim for it to do. Does it drive you nuts that you've got ratings for these shows and Reed Hastings does not share? No, we don't numbers? care. It, it doesn't matter. It, it, some of the guys who work for you care a lot. Yeah, maybe they have an ego nuts. problem, but that's not how we look at it. Question here. Yes, Stephen Wolf Pereira from Newstar. Um, you're president of ad sales for Turner. Donna Speciali re recently announced a partnership with Fox and Viacom called OpenAP. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, team of rivals and what was really the driver behind it? We're just we're trying to get more data in the ad product that we offer to advertisers to compete more effectively with a much bigger set of data that the digital um, companies have. And so, like every other innovation on any network, 
if it doesn't essentially go across the industry, it's probably not going to work because it has to be, it's really about you, the consumer. If you, you, you cannot be looking at your video service, whether you're doing it on broadband or on the TV dial, and having to remember, oh, this channel has this, that channel doesn't, this cable or telco or mobile <laughs> operator has this thing and the other one doesn't. You, that, that is not a recipe for success. So innovation has to be adoptive using a competitive dynamic. You're nodding, that answer your question? One, one, one last question here. Hey Jeff, John Penny, one hey of John. your former employees. Question. John, don't take it out on me though. I won't, you were always great to us. Thank you. Um, what are you seeing going on in international? There's a lot of innovation in international distribution, people skipping yeah. wires in the ground, going to the air, a lot of what you talked about with AT&T. There might be some uh, you know, sample cases out there that you're seeing really interesting things going on. Could you just talk a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, in general, internationally, if you, if you, you have to think of video distribution infrastructures as being very different depending whether it's Asia, Europe, et cetera. It's about, because the new distribution that we've now invented somewhere in the world, broadband and mobile being the newest, that leapfrogs what would have been, let's say, incumbent video distribution in England, which is very different than Brazil and so forth. So you have a, a mix of things going on where all distribution for video in the world is aiming for the ability to have subscriptions, to have video on demand, and to have navigation. Because if you have video on demand, you need navigation. And that's been the great success, essentially, of the digital industry located mostly in California, is so many brilliant innovations in platform capability. And so that's trying to be adopted all over the world. What then happens when you have that as the goal in all these countries is the different video distributors, think of the broadcasters in Western Europe or the ones in South Asia, Southeast Asia, they want to have program rights because they're thinking ahead they can watch the movie going on in the United States and say, all right, we need VOD for, let's say, a full season of shows that, that two years ago they wouldn't have thought of. And so you find companies, Sky is a pretty good example in Western Europe, that's buying first run rights, longer run VOD rights, mobile rights, et cetera. Netflix is doing the same. Netflix does. I mean, it, it varies all over the world. But you, you see, for obvious reasons, those things consumers want, the right bundle choices of channels, the right price points, the right amount of mobility, strong navigation, because with all this new stuff, you have to have a way to find it. Um, those are essentially the universal aspects everybody's trying to build in. You and your peers in, in the big media companies helped jumpstart Netflix's business by selling them to reruns for a while. Yeah. Seems like you now regret that and are pulling away from that. He keeps trying to put words in my mouth. This it is a valued, like... a valued customer that has been uh, giving us a lot of money. And uh, that's a good thing. And I think they've made some terrific programming, which always elevates the creative game for everybody else. So, you know, je ne regret rien, is what we said. I think I understood what that meant. Yeah, we don't regret it. We're gonna leave on French. Thanks, Jeff.